I want you to turn to the book of Job. I've, I've worked on the sermon and I've struggled with Job all week long. You know, suffering is not an easy sur- subject to talk about, is it? Uh, there's no easy answers. And when you read through the book of Job, Job doesn't answer the question why. Okay? Um, suffering is. Is that enough to say? We suffer. All of us have scars. And the longer we live, the more scars we, hit, we, we, we get, right? So let's just agree today that that suffering is. The book of Job is not about the patience of Job. Okay, you've heard that slogan, the patience of Oh, if I just had the patience of Job. You know, it's not about patience. Job is about trusting God in suffering and God trusting you when you suffer. Suffering is both ways. You trusting in God and God trusting in you. Uh, the, the thought struck me as I was studying, do people in America really suffer? I mean, really. Do we suffer? Well, I did a little work on that. Let me just share some answers with you this morning. One out of five Americans suffer from some kind of mental illness. Four out of five in the USA face near poverty. In other words, there are many in this country that suffer economically. One out of seven families in the USA are food insecure. Just yesterday, a man, we were working here at the church, and I want to thank all of those that helped clean the church yesterday. We spit shine Grace Baptist Church. Just go in the bathrooms and go... Smell, you know? Man, we did a job yesterday. But this man walks in and he says, my wife and I are hungry. Imagine that in the United States of America. Somebody is hungry. And I said, well, come on. And uh, I took them over to Loretta's. Now, if you've got a hunger pain, they can fix it right across the street. Right? And uh, I bought them breakfast yesterday morning, in the name of Jesus, because of the love of Grace Baptist Church. People are hungry in this country. 13,776,251 live with cancer every day. How many cancer survivors do we have in here this morning? Yeah. One hundred million people in our country live with chronic pain. You know what chronic pain is? Uh, my, my hero, Brother W. L. Baker, says when you're over sixty, you hurt all the time. And I know that's true. But chronic pain is when you have pain for two months or longer, consistently. That's what chronic pain is. Listen to this one. A divorce happens every 36 seconds in this country. We are family insecure in America. People suffer at home. 40%, listen to this one, 40% of every hospital bed in the United States is occupied by people who suffer because of overuse of alcohol. 40%. Can we say that, yes, we suffer in America? We do. In fact, this country may suffer more than other countries of the world. There is a message that is kind of subtle in the book of Job that says the more you have, the more risk you have to suffer. Look at Job chapter 1, verse 1. Look what it says. There was a man in the land of Uz, 
whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. He was a good man. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. He was a blessed man. And his possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all men of the East. Tremendously blessed. Now can we agree this morning as we approach the book of Job that at least your possessions... What you have, the stuff that occupies your time, that occupies your energy. I got backache this morning because I trimmed hedges yesterday. You know what? I planted those hedges, so I have to trim them. Right? I mean, the more you have, can we agree, does not insulate you from suffering. Even the rich suffer. Great wealth and abundant fortune does not keep us from suffering. So this country suffers. C.S. Lewis said this, But pain, listen to this, But pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts, in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Don't you think that God is shouting to us today in this country? Trying to get our attention. He is calling out to us. Even in our suffering. So that we'll pay attention to him. Now, there's two things I want you to hear from Job today. One is the message of Job, okay? That's where we are. Look at verse, chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. And listen as I read. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? In other words, Satan is challenging God, says, because you take care of him, because you prosper him. He lives righteously. And then listen to what he says. Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will certainly curse you to your face. Now listen to the Lord's response. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Now what I want you to hear from this passage of Scripture this morning is that God has limited Satan when you suffer. He can touch your stuff. He can control events and people around you. But he cannot control you unless you let him. Uh, He'll try to get you to doubt him when you suffer. Where is God? He'll try to get you to deny him when you suffer. Curse him. Came out of his own lips. But he cannot control you. That should be a great encouragement. You know, I went back. Anybody remember Flip Wilson? You remember that? You remember that slogan, the devil made me do it? Remember Geraldine? He would put on that dress and he would talk about the devil just pushed me into that department store. The devil said to me, just go over there and try on that dress. Get behind me, Satan. 
I don't know. He just pushed me to try on that dress. And then the devil just made me pull out your credit card to pay for that dress. The book of Job says there's no truth in the thought that the devil makes you do anything. He can control the stuff around you, but he cannot control you. Now here's the point I want to make. Job's suffering was painful. Oh yes. He suffered. He hurt. He wept. All of the attributes of suffering. But it was also, now you listen to this. It was also a source of high honor. Because God said, Behold, all that he has is yours, speaking to Satan. But it is all, but but you do not put forth your hand on him. In other words, Job not only trusted God, but God trusted Job to carry his honor in the midst of his suffering. I want to tell you that are here in this congregation this morning. I never want to be a church that does not empathize, empathize with the suffering of its people. I mean, we live in a world that is social media over the top. Computers cannot empathize with, empathize with suffering. I do not want this church to become to the point so numbers conscious, so program sensitive that we miss the hurt and pain of our people. I I want to be a shepherding congregation. When I, I, I want Grace Baptist Church to suffer with its people. When you suffer, we suffer. Because suffering is a way to honor. It is a pathway to give glory unto God in the fact that we suffer and we suffer strong together. Listen to what, listen to what Ephesians said. Listen to what Paul said to the church there in Ephesians, in Ephesus. He said, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has ordained that we should walk in them. You know, in suffering, not just in our joy and in our our glory and in our uh, successes, but in our suffering, we are the workmanship of God. He is at work in us. That's what Paul said in Romans. Listen to this. And we know... That in all things, God works together. This is uh, Doug's favorite verse. All things work together for good to those who love Him and have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image. That means God's in control, y'all. Uh, don't, don't get all mixed up with the when and the wherefore of the word predestination. How much does God know? He knows everything. And God is in control. That's what he's saying here. Even in suffering. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. You know what he's saying to us this morning? He's saying to us, if you believe this word, this book, every word of it, If you believe it, and if God works for good to them that are called according to His purpose, there is no time, no situation, no suffering, no pain that God has not limited Satan's power over you. God is in control in everything. Now listen to this one. This will light your fire. Listen to this. This came out of the lips of Jesus. Mark chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. Listen. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, 
He cannot stand, but he is finished. But no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. You know why we suffer? We suffer because we are God's instrument to plunder the strong man's house. And when our strength stands against the suffering of this world, the suffering that Satan throws at us, when we are strong in suffering, we plunder the strong man's house. That's what we're about. You know, I talked to you last week about embarrassing the, the devil, making him shame and blush. We're talking about taking it to him. You know? We're talking about giving the old one two. That's what happens when we suffer. We plunder the strong man's house. You like that? Amen. That was worth coming to church for. This is what you need to know today from the message of Job about suffering. Six things, real quick. If you got your pencil, write them down. Suffering is real. And it happens in spite of your wealth and in spite of your status. Suffering gives us the opportunity. That's number two. Suffering gives us the opportunity to bring glory and honor to God. Aren't you grateful for that? I mean, when, you, when life is at its worst, God's just getting glory out of you. And you're amounting to something in the name of Jesus. Mm. God trusts you, number three, God trusts you and he trusts me to suffer strong. He's got, this challenge in Job was not about Job. Job was not at stake. You know, the challenge was against God. The only reason Job follows you is because you bless him. It's about God's intention, God's purpose. And Satan was challenging God. God trusts you in the midst of of, of suffering. Number four, it is God who gives you victory over suffering. Number five, God comes to you and helps you in times of suffering. Number six, God has bound Satan in chains and he cannot control you or me when we suffer unless we allow it. Now, second thing I want you to know about the book of Job is the meaning of suffering. The meaning of Job. We talked about the message. I want to talk about the meaning. Turn over, if you would, to chapter 42. I'm skipping, yeah, I'm skipping all of that ooh and ah from Bill Dad and all the rest. All his good buddies who really weren't friends at all. Okay? I'm skipping all of that. You can read about that this afternoon if you want to. I'm going to Job's own personal testimony. His own personal confession about what God taught him through suffering. Number one, Job's testimony was how he learned To trust God completely. Look at verse 2 of chapter 42. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. In other words, what uh, what, uh, Job is saying is that this suffering has taught me how to rely on you. He's taught me more about you. Suffering has taught me more about you than I could have learned any other way. You know, there's a difference between knowing God and having Him revealed to us than having Him revealed in us. I mean, you can, you can read every book, how-to book there is on the shelf. You can turn to every preacher that's on the television. You can sit in the seminary classroom. And you can learn vast volumes about God. But when you suffer, you learn about God (laughs) one-on-one, directly. 
unto Him. Now, I'm not saying just discard all, all that's been said about God. You want to hear what other people have experienced. But I want to tell you, it's of little use. It's not worth what you can learn yourself in direct contact with God when He speaks to you in the still of the night, when you're hurting, when you're in pain, and when you don't know what tomorrow holds. And His still small voice comes to you and He says, You are my child. You are in me and I am in you. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. There is victory just down the way. Job chapter 42, verse 1. That is a powerful passage of Scripture. You want to you underline that. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. He said, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. You know, God is remolding us. He is shaping us and transforming us into His image. And that takes a little bit of suffering from time to time. Why? Well, because He Himself suffers. There were scars in His hands. There was a spear imprint in His side. We talked about that to the children this morning. Do you know God suffers for us? Suffers with us? And we need to know about our God who suffers alongside as we suffer. Philippians chapter 3 verses 10 through 12 says that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Listen, y'all. Well, we're a church that gets all goosebumpy when we get the power of his resurrection. I mean, when God is so thick and the Holy Spirit is so powerful and you can just feel it. I mean, it's not hard to preach you when the Holy Spirit just pulls your feet up off the, off the floor. And you feel like the words are, are straight from the mouth of the Lord. Not hard to preach that way. But I want to tell you, you don't get it all unless you fellowship in his sufferings. That's what Paul is talking about. Not only the power, but the fellowship of his suffering. Being conformed to his death in order that I might attain to the resurrection of his death. It takes both sides. And we learn so much about the God who is in us when we suffer. In the name of Jesus. Robbie and I were married. Let's see if I can get this right. August the 16th, 1969. I practiced that this week. August 16th, 1969. And on June 24th, 1970, ten and a half months later, for you that only have ten fingers, ten and a half months later, our daughter Elaine was born. Okay. There when we were just kids, weren't we, Robbie? We were just kids. We went to the hospital and I watched my wife suffer for 23 hours. And back then, you know, you didn't have these nice uh, labor and delivery suites. <laughs> You've been up there, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, man. We had a delivery, labor and delivery ward. Everybody crammed into the same place. You only had curtains. You didn't have nice walls and that sort of curtains separating people. And you knew what was going on in the whole place. We watched ten mothers come and go in that ward. And you know, you can learn a lot about people when they suffer. My sweet wife had already prayed about it. She'd already talked to the Lord about it. She said, Lord, help me in labor. Be with me in labor. And it was almost serene. I want to tell you, I would hold her hand and when the pains would get hard, 
she would grip my hand and she would whimper a bit, but nothing embarrassing, no loud screams or anything like that. She would just hold my hand tight. And we waited all those hours until finally a surgeon was called in so that we could do a cesarean section. Quiet suffering. Suffering in faith and trust. But now there was a lady on the other side (laughs) of the ward. You know, some people suffer quietly and some people suffer out loud. Uh, th- this lady let it fly. <laughs> Every kind of word, both blue words and uh, golden words, every kind of word you could imagine was flying around that room. Uh, when a nurse would walk in there, man, the nurse got both barrels. <laughs> man, after... 46 years, I'm just, a, I'm just a pup. I mean, we got Larry and Margaret, and we got Ed and Marie here. They just celebrated their 50th anniversary a couple of weeks ago, right? I mean, we've got veterans in this room. That's, a, that's what the Lord had in mind. You know, that's what the vows have to say. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer in sickness and in health, through suffering together, there is a oneness and a bond that grows. The problem today is too many families don't let that happen. They opt out because of suffering. But when you stick it out, when you go through it together, Don't you learn to know one another? Doesn't God bring you together? It's what what the Bible calls one flesh. And that's what God desires of His people, that we grow so close and so intimate with Him through our suffering, that we know Him better, we know Him more fully, we know Him more intimately, and our relationship is so strong that we can... Overcome anything that might come our way. That's the first point in chapter 42, verse 1. Second point. You know, I'm just going to skip that. We're running a little late this morning. I'm going to go to the third point. Okay? The second point is just this. God will teach you through suffering how to say, I'm sorry. Look at what it says. Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I've declared this which I do. Have you ever said anything that you wish you could take back? Especially when we suffer. Don't we just complain and, and, and bellyache? I want to tell you, when somebody is suffering, I mean truly suffering, it's never appropriate to say, quit your whining. Just hold their hand. You know... Uh, Job's friends were very quick to <laughs> tell him to just quit belly aching. Trust God. Hold somebody's hand when they're suffering. Anyway, it's never too late to say you're sorry. God always wants to hear it. Chapter, chapter 42, verse 3. Okay? Now, let's go to 4. Verse 4. This is, what, this, this is why you came to church today, Okay? Hear now, and I will speak, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you face to face. It's the difference between hearing and seeing. You see, hearing is that kind of knowledge that you receive. Uh, receive second hand. Uh, other people instruct you. Uh, preachers and professors and friends who want to tell you about how you ought to live and how you ought to suffer. 
But seeing represents that which comes directly from the source. You've heard seeing is believing, right? Well, Jeremiah said it this way, Call to me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. I mean, when you suffer, just cry out to God. Show me, Lord. That's what the prophet said. Listen to what uh, the prophet Isaiah said. He said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I want to tell you, we live on an earthly plane and that occupies most of our existence. But when you suffer, you are immediately transferred to the plane of the Most High. And He reveals to you Himself and His truth and His power and His mercy in ways that you cannot fathom with your eyes focused here on earth. Just pray for God to translate you a little bit so that you can, trans, uh, you can transfer to the portals of glory in the midst of your suffering. Look what Paul said. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But just as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them who love Him, but God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. I want to ask you this morning, how hungry are you for God? How much do you want to know about Him? Oh, oh, just, just uh, keep, me, keep me at arm's length. <laughs> well, you can stay at arm's length if you want to. You, you can choose that distant walk with the Lord if you choose. But I want to tell you, when you suffer, you have an opportunity to get real close. So that He can reveal to you Himself. There was, a, there was a man uh, who was a businessman in town. He had done very well. He, he was prosperous. And he lost his business, lost his job, lost his fortune, lost everything around him. Unfortunately, during the time of his loss of material things, his dear wife passed away and he lost her too. And he found himself alone and he found himself quite bitter at God because of his losses. So one day he decided he was just going to walk downtown and he was walking downtown and he saw the construction of a new church was being built. And he uh, walked in front and was gazing up, a spire and beautiful stonework. And he happened to look over and there was a stone mason along the side who was occupied in his craft. And he had a little hammer and he was chiseling away at a rock that was kind of triangular in its shape. And he walked over to the, to the uh, craftsman and he paid attention to what he was doing and he was careful just to chip a little here and chip a little there. And so he asked the stonemason, uh, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm preparing this stone for a special place. He said, see up there that, that vacancy right underneath the spire? That's where this stone is going to be placed. And what I'm doing is I'm forming it and shaping it by chiseling away in order that it will fit perfectly up there. Yeah. Suffering. The Lord is forming us. He's chipping away that which we really don't need in order that we might fit Perfectly up there. You know what I believe Job has to teach us? 
through the experiences of suffering. Job looked way off into the future. And he saw a Savior who was hung on a cross. Had a crown of thorns on his head. Had nails in his hands and a spear pierced through his side. And he saw a suffering servant who was wounded for our transgressions in order that we might be saved, in order that we might be healed. And you are here in this place this morning because of him. Do you know him? Do you know Jesus? I want you to come to our suffering Jesus and yield your life to Him and allow Him to walk with you in these days of suffering. To hold your hand. To give you strength. And to be your Savior every day of your life. Come to Him. It might be that you're suffering this morning. It might be the that you're carrying a heavy burden, a heavy load. I know some of you are. You can come here into this altar today and you can just lay it all down at the feet of Jesus who has suffered and died for you. And He'll give you encouragement. His Holy Spirit will flood your soul and He will give you everything you need to suffer in His name. Maybe you need to join this church. We're a suffering church. We want to suffer together in the name of Jesus because there's victory in that name. There's victory in that name. Whatever your need is today, don't hold back. Don't give Satan an inch. You come and you do what the Lord calls you to do. As we stand to our feet, our musicians are going to lead us and you come this morning as the Lord leads you.